Good morning, everybody. Wisconsin's 7th Congressional District Representative Tom Tiffany is our very special guest today. Thursday, November 9th, 2023. For Dryden.com, I'm Ben Dryden, and you're watching Dryden Wire Live, presented by Americans for Prosperity Wisconsin. AFP Wisconsin works to reignite the American dream and break down government barriers that hold us back from our full potential. Learn more at americansforprosperity.org and join AFP to fight for more freedom for all Wisconsinites. A special thank you to some of our recent guests here on Dragon Wire Live, including Wisconsin State Senator Romaine Quinn, Wisconsin 75th Assembly District Representative Dave Armstrong, and Barron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald, just to name a few. You can watch a recording of those and all of our previous shows on our website at dragonwire.com, right here on Facebook under the Videos tab, or just go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash DrydenWire. It's kind of a restore all of our shows. But today we're being joined by Wisconsin's 7th Congressional District Representative, Tom Tiffany, who joins us every month for a chat. Tom, good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. It's good to uh, join the Global Blowtorch, headquartered in Spooner, Wisconsin. See, I don't know if that's a compliment. It doesn't sound like it is. Uh, oh, good morning, Gay Magnifici. She's watching this morning. Representative good Magnifici. Morning, Gay. She's such a sweetheart. Um, holy cow. So a lot is you know happening. Did you know Gay is a nurse? I did. Yeah, she served her career as a nurse, um, helping people, um, getting people well. Thank you, Gay, so much for all the work you did all those years. Uh, we were at, it was a, maybe it was like a month, month and a half ago. Uh, Jerusha and I went out to um, Adam Jarko's house just for a little get together. I'd never been out there before. And Gay was there. And... Uh, and her husband, oh, shoot, Tom, I think. Tom. I think it is another Tom. He was out there, Tom. too. Got to meet him. He's a great guy. Uh, I haven't seen, like, in-person gay in forever. Uh, obviously, with COVID, everything kind of screwed everything up. And then I just haven't really gotten around to see her. But, oh, my goodness. She's such Gay's, an amazing person. Gay did so much great work, you know, as a nurse, as I mentioned earlier. But she never was able to fix Tom. You know, no. Tom was above the <laughs> I mean, that just she just is never able to accomplish that, but neither is anyone else. And that's just the cross she bears in this life. I, I was warned about her husband, Tom, before I got there. Like He speaks his <laughs> mind about stuff. I'm like, I like people's strong opinions. Yeah. Uh, so the last time that you were on, there was still the we're waiting for a speaker. And this is kind of old news now, of course, since it's been, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks. But we should probably touch on that. Uh, the House did. Uh, the Republicans, you know, I believe it was universal vote for, or, or, or unc uh, I believe everybody voted for him, Mike Johnson. Why do you think he was elected speaker? Why him and not the others? So first of all, when we were on last month, I told you that, or my prediction, you asked me for a prediction I and I said, I yeah, it'll get done here probably this weekend. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> See, I didn't bring it up. Uh, being a gentleman, I did not bring up that you said, yep, Sunday night. And that was on like a Friday. And it was about another two weeks later. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, I think it was like another 10 days. Or yep. You know, I think I think we had to go through the various leadership people. I mean, you, you kind of saw some of the ladder climbing and, you know, kind of the the underside of politics that people don't like where people are pulling each other down. And that's kind of what happened through the, the whole speaker process. Uh, you know, next up was Steve Scalise once uh, Kevin McCarthy was vacated from the chair. And um, there were some people pulling him down. Jim Jordan was next. Jim got over 200 votes yeah. which a few years ago. That would never happen, but he got over 200. He got 200 votes. He got pulled down. Tom Emmer, who's the whip, from our neighboring state, Minnesota, he got pulled down. And I think it really took somebody that was outside of that leadership structure. And um, Mike Johnson put his name in. And uh, Mike's got a great demeanor. I served with him on judiciary. Uh, he chairs the constitutional subcommittee. He is a constitutional expert. He teaches constitutional law. And uh, yeah, he's just... Um, you know, hopefully he's the man for the time. He does have a big job, though. We only have a four seat majority and it's like herding cats with us Republicans. As I pointed out to many media outlets through that whole process, the Democrats at the end of the day come together behind closed doors and they always provide a united front on something like this, whether it's a speaker vote or whether it's various bills that might be controversial. They always come together and people fall in line. 
That's not what we do as Republicans oftentimes. We simply don't fall in line. You see it locally, you see it out here in Washington, D.C. It's the great thing about our party, and it can also be the downside of our party is being able to come together. But anyhow, Mike was able to, uh, Mike Johnson was able to uh, put the coalition together, received a unanimous vote. He is now the speaker, and he's got a lot of work in front of him. Um, I think he has a vision for America. And he shares that with the people. I think his greatest asset is his demeanor. Um, he is always in a good mood. He always projects a positive air. And I think that's so important in a leader. If there is something that looking back on, and hindsight being what it is, that maybe not necessarily you, but if you look at more of the macro level that the Republicans, is there something that we've learned from this, Right as a Congress or you as, a, or as Republicans that, okay, next time, hopefully there isn't a next time, but if we did this again, we should probably have done it this way. Or is it, this is what all needed to have happen in order to get to where we were or to where we are. You know, it, it really is what it is. And, sure. um, you know, you can't change it, but I think, you know, in regards to Kevin McCarthy, I would say to you, the mistake that he made was when he made the commitment, back at the first of the year, remember four days, 15 votes. That was all about process in the House and having a more open, deliberative process that the American people could follow. No more of this Nancy Pelosi stuff where you put Christmas tree bills on the floor, where you get two hours to study a thousand page bill and then vote on it. The American people know better than that. And so um, we just believe people are sick of that. Uh, uh, McCarthy agreed to that. And so he really needed to start the appropriations process earlier because he made a commitment to have those done by September 30th. Instead, we get a continuing resolution that just, you know, um, you know, you continue as is. There needs to be changes. There needs to be a thorough budgeting process. No different than like the state does a really good job via their joint finance committee and the budgeting process in Wisconsin, first of all, they have to have a balanced budget, which we don't have out here, but that's another whole nother issue. But they go through every part of the budget. We don't do that when we do these continuing resolutions and omnibus spending bills. And um, so what needs to happen, I would say to you, uh, for Speaker Johnson, as we go forward, as we get through this process where we're still passing these appropriations bills, Next year, because we do an annual budgeting process, contrary to the state, which is a biennial process, we need to start that budgeting process earlier so it's done by September 30th. Smart. And those appropriations bills are that they are to the Senate before mm. September 30th. Uh, there's a few things I wrote down. As always, I like to have a couple things written down to make sure we talk about. But to kind of put a bow on this one, um, after Mike Johnson, because I'd never heard of him. I think most people had not really heard of him, or many people didn't weren't aware of who he was. So in following his um, election and becoming the speaker for at least 10 days, all the headlines and all the national media were kind of, I wouldn't say going after him, but certainly focusing on, we'll say, uh, where he stands on certain issues. But ultimately, this was going after him for his faith. That's how I saw it. And I don't know where I'm from. It's, well, same area that you are. But I mean, just in life in general, there's two things you never, ever, ever go after somebody for. You never go after them for their faith, regardless if it's they, it's your faith or if it's uh, something that's different or if they're agnostic, atheist. It doesn't matter. That, that's what you believe. Or, and you never go after somebody's family. Both those things are very personal. Well, this seemed to be, you know, apparently that doesn't work in either national media or in Congress. Are you okay with that? Where it's, no, nah, everything's, uh, or I should say nothing is off limits. Go after anybody for anything you want. Are you comfortable with that? You know, not okay with it, but it's the world that we live in. And so we live in the world we live in. But yeah, uh, you know, in the mainstream media views someone who is faithful as, I mean, really a as a demeaning thing that that diminishes a person. And Mike Johnson is very candid with people. I mean, he said in one of his first interviews, if you want to know who I am, and what my beliefs are, read the Bible. Amen. And so that's what they were taking, some in the mainstream media, and trying to cast aspersions at him because he is a faithful person. And, uh, I mean, if you take a look at his family, if you look at how he leads his life, 
Um, I would say America would be served very well by having more people like Mike Johnson. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that they didn't report is his family took in a young man who they found underneath the bleachers, who's basically a, a homeless child. They took him into their home. I mean, they not only talk about it, they live it. And the other thing that I loved the exposure that he got, I think it was a hit piece by political or one of the, one of the, uh, rags out here, one of the Hill rags out here in Washington, DC. They said, do you know that Mike Johnson only has $5,000 in his savings account and he doesn't own any stocks? So in other words, he's like the rest of America. And they're treating that like that is a, you know, uh, uh, that that's something that's just wrong. And so here's somebody that's like the rest of America and they're disparaging him for that. So um, I sure hope, uh, I wish Mike the best. And um, I, I think he has the demeanor. I think he has the philosophy that can get America back to the right place because mm. that's ultimately what it's all about. Uh, now that he is a uh, speaker and now that the house has a speaker, how does that now impact where we, we as a country or we as in Congress, which is more you, regarding the Israel-Hamas uh, Israel war? Uh, has this now, okay, now that we have a speaker, we can start doing something. Has that impacted at all? And if it has, what is that impact? Now, we were continuing our work through the whole process. I'll go back to the four days and 15 votes in early January. People were saying, oh, gosh, this looks terrible, awful, all the rest. It's part of the deliberative process. And, you know, rather than doing stuff fast, let's do it right. Because when we would see those Nancy Pelosi spending bills, a thousand pages, and it would come directly out of her office, not through committee, and you'd have two hours to be able to um, study it and then vote on it, that's doing it fast. And as we can see with what's happening in America, it was doing it wrong. So I think it's more important to get it right. And so we've been working on all those things. When we get done with our business here today in about an hour, um, we're going to pass another appropriations bill that will be, I think, about 85 percent of the appropriations bills we will have passed in terms of the value of those appropriations bills and send them to the Senate. And the Senate has been in uh, session through that whole period of time while we had the interlude for naming a new speaker. And they've only got about three or four done. We've been getting work done. And I can't wait till we get the rest of the appropriations mm. process done. Hopefully it'll be real soon. See, that's interesting because all the stories that I read on national media, I'm not, I'm not trying to bang on national media, just that's, I don't have inside information. I read what everybody else reads, that basically the house was just shut down. That's, that's how they portrayed it, that nothing was getting done and nothing can get done until the speaker was elected. So um, accurate to a certain extent. So we could not vote on bills on the floor. So if there's bills that were waiting coming out of committee or whatever, then that is correct. We could not vote on them until we had a speaker. But in terms of committee work and other things getting okay. done, um, we were actively working on that. I know there's a couple of the appropriations bills. I was submitting am amendments and um, working behind the scenes. So definitely there was a slowdown and we could not pass anything um, off from the floor as a result of that. But that doesn't mean we simply stopped working. And where are we kind of right now for people who don't follow the news or read the news? They're too busy, which I totally understand that, or just don't really want to actually you know, read about the issues going on in the Middle East, which I also can appreciate. Where are we right now? Where is Congress right now? So we in the House last week, one of our first um, actions after Mike Johnson became speaker was to pass a bill to help fund uh, the defense of Israel. And it's primarily the defense of Israel. For example, for those people that are familiar with the Iron Dome, um, which we have helped fund in Israel, Israel's paid for much of it, but we've helped fund it and we've advanced the technology to them. That's a defensive weapon. That just shoot, that shoots down rockets that are being sent by ha Hamas or Hezbollah or any of those um, any of those organizations that, by the way, are funded by Iran. And uh, so uh, we passed a bill, I think it was about $14 billion, uh, and we've sent that to the Senate. But what we're saying now is that it's got to be funded. We were not going to do just simply, we're sending you $14 billion. We got to stop doing that because 
while it's important to help the Israelis, I believe, we've got big enough problems with our debt here in America. And $33 trillion, $2 trillion more this year. I mean, it's just getting out of hand. And it's leading to so many of the ills that are affecting us. Higher interest rates. Uh, you, you, you look at the prices of things. Um, much higher with inflation. So we got to make sure we take care of our own house. And so what we did is we said, we're going to take $14 billion from the IRS, which was um, passed in the last session of Congress by Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, and Chuck Schumer to the tune of $80 billion plus. And we said, we're going to pull some of that money back and we're going to pay for this um uh, this funding of Israel and their defense weaponry, we are going to pay for that so that the American people don't have to absorb more debt. That was probably the biggest change that we did. But we passed that last week. It sits before the Senate and Chuck Schumer should pass it to be able to help the people of Israel. I, if I recall last month when you were on, I asked you about do, do you foresee a situation where we would have boots on the ground? As of right now, do you... Uh, I, I'm sorry, going back, I believe you had said there doesn't seem to be any reason as of now, a month ago, or need to do that. Do you still believe that to be true? I cannot predict what the Biden administration will do. I sure hope that is not the case. There is no reason for us to get into another war in the Middle East. There's no reason for us to get in another war in Europe after two world wars over the last hundred years. I don't believe there's any reason for that. But it is concerning. I am hearing more people, especially young people on college campuses, are beginning to get worried as a result of the under recruitment in our military services. They are, they are not hitting their goals at all in terms of recruitment into uh, the military branches. There's young people are starting to get concerned. Are we going to have another draft? And um, uh, I sure hope the Biden administration doesn't do that. Um, you know, I. I hope that does not happen. That has to be like uh, what are, uh, that uh, political suicide. I've heard of that term before. That has to be, and maybe that's obviously uh, hyperbole and extreme, but I can't imagine any president wanting to do that. I mean, I don't see how you bounce back from that. Uh, that's not, that can't be a, uh, not saying that it wouldn't be needed, but that's not a popular thing to say or do. I, I can't imagine that, right? Come on. Yeah, but we've also seen with this administration if you were, would have been told two and a half years ago, January 20th of 2021, that President Biden was going to say, yeah, we're going to let 10 million illegal aliens into the United All States. All right, fair point. I mean, fair point. who knows what they're going to do? Yeah, hey, how is that southern border working out? Boy, it, it's actually getting worse. Talking how? to the Arizona rep the Arizona representatives, the numbers are just staggering at this point. But what's what we're seeing more and more, both in the southern border as well as down in the Darien Gap in Panama, is that there are more and more military age men coming from places like Syria, China and uh, places like that. This is really serious stuff at this point. And at 10 million people and counting, I mean, it is beginning to look more and more like an invasion. And the Biden administration is turning a blind eye to it or else they're OK with it. There's a lot of uh, stories out there and we see this a lot on TV. and I'm sure you see this stuff, too, that the 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 Israel Hamas war leading to a lot of division amongst Americans, uh, clashes between pro-Palestinian and pro-Israel. Why do you think this is for, I mean, over there? We totally understand that that's the culture. That's the way it is. It doesn't mean it's right. It's just that's the way it is um, in that part of the region. But it seems to be trickling down a little bit or at least coming over here to America where there's a lot of division on this one. Do you see yeah. that? And if so, does that make you concerned? It's almost like extreme two different sides and not all of them. But there's a lot of division about that just in America. Does that have any influence or impact on decisions that Congress makes? I do think it's a small number of people that are taking this anti-Israel position. And uh, I just think that they are very vocal. And I also think you're seeing, uh, uh, I'm not on TikTok, but I ask people occasionally what they're seeing on TikTok, which of course is Chinese control. TikTok is overwhelmingly, the information is slanted anti-Israel, anti-Jewish, 
and it's pro Hamas, pro Palestine. And that, I mean, TikTok is a, is a very popular app amongst young people. And so I think you're seeing a lot of information that's being pushed to the American people trying to influence this debate. But at this point, I think it's a small number of people that have taken this um, strong stance that, hey, we're pro-Palestine and we are anti-Israel. And um, but it's certainly waking up. I hope it's waking up Americans to what has been going on, especially on our college campuses. Mm. We just had a hearing in the Judiciary Committee yesterday about this um, anti-Jewish, not just rhetoric, but threats to destroy Jewish people. I mean, it is nasty stuff right now that is going on in some of our college campuses. And what we have is college administrators who are fearful of the left and the pro-Palestinian people. And you have these people that are, uh, especially some college professors that take the approach that America is evil and therefore they take the side of Palestine. Israel is evil. You see far too many of those professors in our university. And those are the people that are teaching our kids. It's a real problem at this point, but they are nasty because we've seen them out here. In fact, last week I had one accost me right here in the Cannon office building that I'm in when I was down in the rotunda. And she went after me, she followed me all the way down the hall hallway yelling at me in regards to Palestine. They don't want to have a civil debate. They want to force their views on the rest of America. And that's concerning. So where does this, what's next? In a month from now, because you come on every month, in a month from now, uh, is this going to be fixed, automatically better? How do we temper that those emotions here in America? Oh, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't mind having good, robust debate. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you s step over the line and you say, we need to destroy the Jewish people, that becomes a whole nother matter when yeah. you do something like that. Yeah. So let's have the debate. And if people want to be uh, pro-Palestinian state, okay. if they want to defend Hamas, you know, if they want to do those things, Let's have that debate. That's the great thing about America. We should be open to that debate. And but uh, there's just some people that are going too far, especially. I mean, when when you're threatening the lives of Jewish students on college campuses, when you see the gentleman out in Los Angeles that was run down by someone who was pro-Palestine this past week, I mean, that's nasty stuff, and that needs to stop. Uh, we only have about 10 minutes left. There's a couple of questions. We'll get to all that after 15 seconds from a word from Spooner Health. Satisfaction surveys and in conversations with patients, they appreciate the fact that staff got to know them. Staff really took their preferences into account, and they just feel grateful that they are being cared for as a person. To learn more about our services, visit SpoonerHealth.com. All right, so here's a, a question uh, from Brian, Wisconsin is one of only 10 states that have not taken advantage of federal funding for Medicaid expansion while we have a high need for low-income families. Why won't you support return if our tax dollars to help our families in need? So what I suggest to Brian, that is a decision that the state legislature makes. And I would urge him to propose that question next time you have Romaine Quinn on the, the show. Uh, It'll be two weeks from today. Yeah, I will. pose that question because that's a decision for the state uh, to handle. Now, when I was on the Joint Finance Committee, which was you know five, six years ago, yep. the reason we did not um, accept the Medicaid expansion is because it would have driven up the cost for the of health care for the rest of the state, for those people that are on private health insurance. And we showed that it actually would be a net loser for the state of Wisconsin because of how Medicaid is implemented um, it actually would have ended up being a net loser for people here in the state of Wisconsin. All right. And this is from Renee. Rumor has it. I love anything that starts with rumor has it. Uh, <laughs> China and Russia is um, setting back, watching us spend our money in weapons. Then when Russia and China feel they seen enough, they will attack our country. Hey, any thoughts on that? 
I don't know that they'll attack our country, you know, like, let's say Pearl Harbor or anything like that. But I think you see indirect attacks. That's why it concerns me. You see all these um, military aged Chinese uh, people that are coming through the Daring Gap in Panama and heading up to the United States. Where are they going? And you're seeing Middle Easterners, including from Syria, that are hiding their faces as they come into America when people try to photograph them. OK, why are you hiding yourself if you're coming into America? Um, number one, are you illegally coming here mm. or do you have um, are you thinking about bringing terror to the mainland? FBI Director Ray said under questioning about two weeks ago before the United States Senate, he said that the terror threat in America by outside interests is at a whole new level right now. And that's what we're all concerned about. How do you let 10 million people into this country and not fully vet them? You've got a million and a half gotaways. We have no idea who they are or where they're at. A million and a half in the What's United a States of America. Uh, that's somebody that has evaded the border patrol and we have no idea who they are. 10 million? 1.5 million oh, gotaways. Still, holy frick. 1.5 million. You don't think some of those have ill intent for America? You don't think that, to, to Renee's question, if Russia and China seek to, um, uh, to infiltrate our country, to do bad things in our country, they don't have to attack us. They can just use our open border to infiltrate the country. And FBI Director Ray, I think, highlights it very well. Our country has never been more vulnerable at this point, and the Biden administration does not care. I went to your website this morning, and uh, we usually publish all your press releases, but it's a, just a quick, easy place to go to see. Usually when you send them, we post them too. Uh, and you had one on here that I don't even know what this is about. I don't even think we published this one. I must have missed it. The headline was, Tiffany questions city council on Chippewa Valley refugee resettlement. And I purposely did not click it and read it. I just copied it so I can find out exactly what this is about the same time everybody else does if they didn't see that press release. What is that about? There's an organization called the World. I think it's World Relief Organization. I think I have that right. Um, they want to resettle refugees in uh, the Chippewa Valley and specifically in Eau Claire. And um, my understanding is that the leaders in the city of Eau Claire knew about this a year ago and did not reveal it to the public in a timely fashion. So you had some people that got wind of it and they showed up at a meeting and said, what's going on here? Who are the refugees? What's going on? You know, where are they coming from? Are you fully vetting them? All the questions that should go into something like this and there were more questions than there were answers. So I sent a letter to the leadership of the city of Eau Claire and I said, what's going on here? Because it appears you're keeping the uh, people in the dark in regards to this. Because remember, the Biden administration has a very bad track record in this regard. If you remember when the Afghanistan withdrawal happened a little over two years ago, August of 2021, they said at the outset, yeah, we vetted all these people. And, I went down to Fort McCoy and asked the commander when they had 13,000 people down there, have these people all been fully vetted? And he said, no, they have not. Very few people were vetted that came out of Afghanistan. What happened as a result of that? You had people that we had deported back to Afghanistan that came in um, in August of 2021, just came back into our country. You had people that, I mean, there were child rape cases that happened. I mean, there's all these really terrible things happen. I mean, Fort McCoy, I can't remember the exact figure, Ben, but after they got done with resettling the Afghans that came into Fort McCoy, it cost them, I think like $40 million to rebuild Fort McCoy, to redo it because it had been just trashed. And so why isn't the leadership in the city of Eau Claire telling their local citizens, this is what's been proposed by the World Relief Organization because they are correct in Eau Claire when they said to me and they sent a testy response back. They were correct when they said, this is up to the federal government. We don't get to decide that. That is correct. 
the Biden administration and the federal government, they get to decide if they want to resettle people in America, which, by the way, I think the law should be changed in that regard. But that's a story for another day. Um, but you should at least tell people so they can contact their congressman, Derek Van Orden, so they can contact their U.S. senators, Ron Johnson and Tammy Baldwin, and say, hey, we want more answers here because the Biden track record is not good. In fact, we're seeing the idea floated by some Democrats, including Ocasio-Cortez and Bowman out in New York City. Why don't we bring these Palestinian refugees into America, up to a million of them? I mean, look at what's happening in the Middle East. Look what happened on October 7th. Those are just heinous crimes that were happened. And if you're not familiar with it, you need to take a look. And it will be gut-wrenching to watch it because it is as nasty a stuff as you will find what Hamas did to the Israelis. But you owe it to yourself to know what happened there. And then for America to consider bringing in more refugees. I think we need to think long and hard about that, especially after having... Uh, brought 10 million people in illegally over the last two and a half years. No, this decision is ultimately the president's. Is that correct? It is. It oh, is. Is that, a, is that the school bell? Is recess over? <laughs> is that, oh, that's right. You have a bill. Oh, okay. Yeah. You have a thing coming up to go and vote on. You were just talking about it in a couple minutes. I, I want to get to this also when I was on your Yeah, they're going to let the congressman out to play. <laughs> <laughs> Now, that would be awesome. Like, I'm actually just picturing right now everyone playing, like, uh, Foursquare. Like, a whole bunch of Democrats, Republicans playing Foursquare at recess time. That would be awesome. That's the Congress we all wish we kind of had. Um, I also saw, and I know you love this stuff. Love it. We talk about it every time this comes up. And the headline, this was your press release, Tiffany announces United States Service Academy nominations. For people who don't know what that is, what is it? Yeah. So every member of Congress, the president and the vice president, are allowed to name um, students, young people, uh, nominate them to be able to serve in the service academies, you know, West Point, Air Force Academy, all those. And um, so we get the ability to nominate 11 people, and we did that this year, and it's terrific. It's usually a couple times a year that we will do a military academy day where um, young people can figure, uh, they can come in, ask questions, know what this is all about. We try to answer their questions. We bring people in from the service academies so they can answer these people's questions. And uh, so we had 11 people that we nominated and boy, they're from all over the district. We are so happy. Uh, the quality of the candidates that come forward. And this is the same every year. You just get terrific candidates that come forward. These are people that are leaders within their school, within their classes, within their communities. And to have them step forward and want to fulfill a position of leadership in our military academies is something that's so important for the future of our country. We were really pleased to announce 11 of them just the past week. Did you watch the debate last night? I did not. I, you know, I read some of the afters, but yeah. no. Uh, we were actually voting last night, and uh, oh. so did not have time. Well, unless Donald Trump is on the stage, I really don't care, to be honest. Not because I like or dislike him. I'm just saying, what's the point? It's like, hey, did you watch the Super Bowl, but the best team wasn't in the Super Bowl. What, what's the Yeah, the, <laughs> what? yeah. Oh, no, that's what, that's like, what a lot of This is silly. It's a the waste one, of time. One, yeah, the one after action that I heard, I mean, I, mean, I would just... It sounds like Governor DeSantis did a really good job in that's regards what I to heard. talking about yeah. policy. And that's who he is. I mean, uh, he was in and spoke at a Lincoln Day dinner in Wisconsin earlier this year. And he really is focused on policy. You know, set the personality stuff aside. Let's make sure we're doing what's right for the American people. It sounds like he was very much on message last night in that regard. Yeah, and that other uh, Vivek something. Vivek? Uh, apparently he didn't do so hot. Well, he and Nikki Haley, uh, it doesn't appear they like each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I don't know if you want to tell a mother what to do with their kids and if they're on TikTok or not. Uh, special thank you to Wisconsin's 7th Congressional District Representative Tom Tiffany for taking time to come on for a chat today. I'll see you right back here on Tuesday when Barron County Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald and I will be back for our weekly Positive Tuesday with Ben and Fitzy show. So until then, for DrydenWire.com, I'm Ben Dryden saying thank you for watching, and as always, have a blessed day.